Hey, we're so stoked you chose to tune in with us today, and it's been incredible to see how many of you have joined us from all around the country every Sunday. We want you to know that our goal is to not only be a place where you can hear the word, but also get connected. We want you to be a part of the amazing things that God is doing here at Bakersfield First Assembly, and we hope that you enjoy today's sermon by our lead pastor, Pastor James. I have a few more sermons that I'm going to preach to you in Exodus, and then we're going to take a couple months off. I've got a whole new series, a series I've, of, on a subject I've never preached on before, so I'm pretty fired up. That'll start in October, and then in February, we'll get back in Exodus, give you a little bit of break and catch your breath. And so let's, let's carry on from where we were a couple weeks ago. The Lord had delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He had brought them through the wilderness and they traveled all the way to Mount Sinai to meet with God. This is what God wanted to do. He wanted to meet with his people. I want you to understand God's the same today. He wants to meet with his people. He wants to meet with you personally. And you have to believe that about God because that is his desire. He is a personal God. And so we are we ready and willing to meet with him is the key because he's, he's always willing and ready to meet with us. So let's pick up our story at Exodus 19, verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then the Lord told, then Moses told the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. And not a hand is to be laid on him, whether man or animal. He shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they go up to the mountain. Before we can meet with God on the mountain, we must first believe, number one, that God will speak. God said he would come to Moses in a dense cloud. Now, that doesn't mean a cloud that's really stupid. It means a thick cloud. And the people would hear the voice of God for the first time. This is incredible. Now, Moses had been speaking with God, but this would be the first time the people heard God's voice. The Lord does want to communicate with his people. God does speak to us, but we don't always hear it. Most often, he does not speak to us in an audible voice. I want you to know if you're hearing a lot of audible voices, it's probably not a good thing, and it's probably not God. God most often speaks to us through the Bible. If you want to converse with the Lord on a daily basis, you need to pray and read your Bible every day. Now, I'm not trying to be super strict and legalistic. You may miss a day here and there, but I want you to understand that we need to have regular time of reading our Bible and prayer if we're ever going to be able to hear his voice. You've got to know his word because God is talking every day. He speaks through his Bible. I'm telling you, I'll read through my Bible. I've read that Bible through so many times, and yet every time God speaks to me something fresh and anew to my heart because that's how God speaks through his word. And he also speaks to our spirits in a still, small voice. You see, sometimes we want this loud, audible direction from God. We, just, we want to just, God, just tell us what to do and we'll do it, write it in the sky, make it loud so I understand it. But that's not how God most often speaks. Elijah had to learn that. He was a great prophet of God. He did many miracles. And yet, after a great miracle, the queen Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you, and he took off running for his life. He was scared to death. And when he was alone in the wilderness and he felt like he was the only one left, that nobody cared, that God didn't care, he said, this is what happened in 1 Kings 19, 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And so God's telling Elijah, okay, you want to hear my voice? You You want to see me? Okay, I'm about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. 
but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. I mean, you know, we've had some earthquakes lately. The earth's been moving under our feet. <laughs> after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, and the Lord was in the whisper. You see, God speaks through a gentle whisper. He does not speak, in this case, through a, a powerful wind or an earthquake or fire or pyrotechnics and a loud an explosion. He speaks through a gentle whisper to our hearts. And to hear a gentle whisper, how many know you got to be quiet yourself? You got to be quiet on the outside and you got to be quiet on the inside. You're not going to hear the gentle whisper of God if there's too much noise and distraction in your life. We have to have that time of quiet and solitude. It's one of the disciplines in the Bible, times of solitude, so we can hear God's voice. And the struggle is hearing him speak when there's so much noise going on in the world. Went fishing in Mammoth last weekend. Yep, that's where I was. Your pastor was playing hooky. <laughs> to my, doing my favorite thing in the world, fishing, bless God. Once you know there's going to be fishing in heaven. I know it. So went fishing in Mammoth last weekend with a great friend of mine named Wayne Gaines. He, we worked in the oil industry together and he tends our church. And we caught over 70 trout in three days. Yeah, it was awesome. We were, we were rocking it. Now, some of you are thinking, isn't it five trout a limit per day, Pastor? Did you break the law? No. We threw most of them back. It was catch and release. We didn't break the law, just so you know, your pastor's being honest. And I didn't catch the most. You know, it was a little bit of competition there, and I lost. But anyway, just we're out there in, the, in a creek, San Joaquin Creek, hear the water streaming down and the birds and just the beauty of creation. And both Wayne and I are saying, is, this is like heaven's going to be. I mean, this is so beautiful. I love this so much. We were just basking in the beauty and the soothing sounds of the forest. It was awesome. But then I had to go potty. <laughs> now... I hadn't worn my chest waders in a long time, so they're kind of rusty, so I had a hard time getting out of those chest waders by myself. And so this is a little awkward, but Wayne had to help me. We grew closer through this experience of me getting out of my chest waders because I had to go. So when I finally got out of my chest waders, I had to hurry. Plus, God, I got to go, got to go. Because, man, when I'm fishing, man, I'm going to fish till the very end, you know, until I can't go. So I decided I had to walk through the campground there and trying to find an outhouse or a porta potty or something. And as I walked through the campground, there was this campsite playing loud music. I got to tell you, I, that's a huge pet peeve of mine. I go camping not to hear your rock and roll, baby. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go camping to hear Eddie Money singing Two Tickets to Paradise. We know he went to heaven. After all, he had two tickets to paradise. I've been waiting all week to use that. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I come camping for the quiet, not for the noise. And, and so if you're one of those people that blare your music at camping or while you're on your ski boat on the lake, I forgive you. And I still love you. But knock it off. I mean, you know, there's a lot of shrill and obnoxious voices in the world. Man, we see it on TV, it's on Facebook, people blasting. There's so much noise, so much information, so, and it's so loud, and a lot of it's not even true. And so I'm telling you, there's all these things. You don't know if the news is right or if it's fake news. And there's just so much going on. So how do we know? How do we know what the voice of God is? Well, Jesus said that you should be able to recognize his voice. Look at John 10, 2 through 5 and verse 27. Jesus said, The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. We know the shepherd is Jesus and we are the sheep. 
He calls his own sheep by name. You know, God calls you by name. He knows you intimately. He knows everything about you. He knows everything you've ever done, anything you're ever going to do, and he still loves you. He calls you by name, and he leads them out. Verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep will follow him because they know his voice. They know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Verse 27, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. How can you follow Jesus if you can't recognize his voice? If you are a Christian, you need to learn to recognize the voice of the Lord. We need to listen. We need to pay attention. We need to quiet our spirits or we'll never hear it. It is imperative, especially in these last days, that we recognize the voice of Jesus because Jesus said in the last days there will be many claiming to be the Christ, but they're not. The Bible says in the last days there'll be a great deception that so, so great is the deception that even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. How many know we need to know his voice? You know, a lot of voices sound convincing. And they sound close to God's voice because how many of you know that in every lie there's a little bit of truth? And so we got to recognize that voice even though it sounds, man, it sounds Christian. Man, it sounds right. Now, my voice is very similar to both my son Josiah and Jaden. And sometimes when one of us calls Jolene, she doesn't know which one she's talking to. Boy, we could have a lot of fun with that, but we don't because she's mama. But it takes a lot of careful concentration and close attention to know which one of us it is. You know, there's a lot of voices out there that sound like God's voice, but they're not. And so it takes careful concentration and close attention on our parts to discern which voice is the Lord's. So this is why we need to know the Bible. This is why we need to know God's word, because I'm telling you, if you know the truth, you'll be able to spot a lie a mile away. You'll know this isn't right. This doesn't line up to God's, God's Bible. This doesn't line up to the truth. But God's voice will never contradict what he has already said in his word. I knew a man who got saved, and then he decided to, he said, God told me to divorce my wife. He did not have any biblical grounds to divorce his wife. And he said, well, God told me to divorce my wife. How I many of you know that wasn't God? There was another voice that was telling you to do that. Because God will not contradict his word. He will not go against what he's already said. And so before you can meet with God and hear him speak, you must also, number two, consecrate yourself. This word is all through the Bible, consecrate. What does it mean? It's the same root word as holy in the Bible. And God told Moses, you need to consecrate the people before they come to the mountain of God. The word consecrate means to dedicate or to set apart for a divine purpose. I want you to know that every Christian has a divine call on their life. I don't care what you're doing for a living. I don't care where, what status of society you are in. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are to be dedicated to a divine purpose. You're not there to work at that job or go to that school. God has you there on a mission. You are consecrated to God. He has plans for you. He has a mission for you. He has a purpose on your life. Ask yourself, are you fulfilling your divine purpose? You have to prepare yourself and do what it takes to fulfill the call of God on your life. I mean, you know, if you've got a call of God, there are many steps to get there. Sometimes you have to go back to school or, or sometimes you have to deal with other things, but you've got to make yourself ready for the call of God. Israel was often challenged to consecrate themselves before a big event or a huge battle or an encounter with God. In fact, before Joshua led the people of Israel into conquest of the promised land, he said this, look at Joshua 3, 5. 
Joshua told the people, consecrate yourself, same word. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So think about that. Consecrate yourselves. Do you expect God to do amazing things in your life? Then consecrate yourself. Prepare for it. Get ready for it. If you will consecrate yourself in preparation and expectation of a divine call in your life, God will come through. But we, we got to get ready for revival. We got to prepare our own hearts. We got to get hungry for God. We got to get passionate for the Lord. We have to consecrate ourselves and dedicate ourselves to his purposes, his plan. What does God want to do in your life? When you became a Christian, it's no matter what you want to do. It's now what God wants to do. He's the boss. And what's great about it is he is going to do amazing things in your life. And so part of getting ready and part of consecrating ourselves is learning to, number three, live within the limits. God told Moses to put limits on the mountain to keep the people from going too far. You see, if the people got too close to the mountain, it would cause their death. And so God puts boundaries and borders and limits in our lives to keep us from going too far. He sets limits for our protection. While I was up in Mammoth, we took the hike to Rainbow Falls. Let me tell you something. It was a, about a two and a half mile hike Beware of a hike where the downhill is at the beginning. I'm just warning you right now. It is not as fun coming back up. And we hiked all the way down to Rainbow Falls. Now I tried to do some fishing in Rainbow Falls. Stupid people were swimming with their dogs there and I kept hooking them. No, I didn't, really, I didn't hook anybody. But I did try to fish there. Didn't catch a ripping thing. But anyway, what was interesting is there are several lookouts to see the falls. And at every lookout, there are signs and barriers to keep people from falling into the falls. And we were commenting, What's, why do we have to warn people? I mean, come on, is, don't you know you shouldn't fall over into the waterfall? That's not what waterfall means. <laughs> but we know if there weren't the signs, if there weren't the barriers, and you know what? People crawl over the barriers anyway. It happens at Yosemite all the time, right? Get the perfect selfie of me falling off the falls. In Yellowstone, when I went to Yellowstone Park, there's all these trails through the geysers, and they say, don't go off the trail. People go off the trail and fall into a geyser and become barbecue crispy. The warning signs and fences are there to protect us and keep us alive, not to keep us from having fun. You see, sometimes we think the commandments of God are to take away all our fun. No, commandments of God are to protect you and to protect others. When we get back in February, we're going to go over the Ten Commandments. And you know, Ten Commandments are a good thing. Here was a, a group of slaves who didn't know how to govern themselves, and God gave them all the laws to help them live a civilized life. And there are people that come against the display of the Ten Commandments. What are you, what are you against? Thou shalt not kill. Would you like that to be, you know, thou shalt murder? I mean, which do you prefer? And so the, the commandments of God and the limits of God are for our benefit and for our protection and for the people around us. And so God places limits in our life for a reason. Pastor Alberto preached on boundaries several weeks ago on Sunday night it was excellent so when we live within the limits God sets for us he does something look at Psalm 147 verse 14 he makes peace in your borders he fills you with the finest of wheat did you hear that God gives us peace within our borders, not outside of them. If you want peace, you stay in the boundaries God set. If you want turmoil, you, you violate the limits of God. 
We're not to test the limits God has placed in our life. We are not to move the boundaries he has established. The Bible challenges us in this regard in Proverbs 22, verse 28. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your forefathers. There are things in place for a reason. There are boundary stones we're not to move. There are limits we are to live within. How I many you know there are financial limits? You can't live like a millionaire if you ain't one. Right? We, we have to live within our means. That's what God wants us to do is live within our means. He wants us to live debt free. We need to work toward being free. Because those are the limits where God can bless us. And you know what? When you live within God's financial limits, he will often extend those limits and bless you. But we are blessed within the limits, not outside of them. There are relationship boundaries, right? Aren't we learning that in the media t today, in the Me Too era? There are to be boundaries. And let me tell you, if you are a Christian and you're married, you should not be flirting with somebody that isn't your spouse. Don't play that game, uh-uh. That's not where we belong. We've got limits to protect us and to protect our relationships. There's boundaries of blessing. There are behavioral borders. God will bless us and protect us when we live within the limits. Before we can approach the mountain, we must, number four, wait for the right time. God first says, tell the people don't go to the mountain or they'll get stoned. And some are like, yeah, not that kind of stone. <laughs> it's with rocks. And so God says, don't go, to the, don't go to the mountain. But then he says, when you hear the trumpet sound, then come. And so God was going to bring them closer at the right time. Wait for the right time. Timing is so very important to God. I'm telling you, so much in the Bible is written about things coming at the right time, at the fullness of time, at the proper time. There, God really cares about time and the timing in your life. Look at Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1 and 11. I love this, I love this passage. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. I mean, you got to love a book that starts off, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Yeah, I'm in. But I love the wisdom here that says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. I love this season. It's called football season. <laughs> There's two seasons in my life, football season and depression season. Because I get depressed when football's over. But there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And this is awesome. Verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You know, there are some ugly things in your life that God's going to make beautiful if you give him time to do it. You see, we either get behind God or get ahead of God. But if we will trust him, if we will wait for the right time, we wait on God. Sometimes we jump into things too quickly. We try to fix it ourselves. We are control freaks and we try to make things happen and we just mess it up. That's exactly what Moses did. He messed it up. Because, you know, you can do the right thing at the wrong time. And Moses did that. He was born to deliver Israel from slavery in Egypt. He was weaned till he was five years old. So he was told his whole growing up that you are going to be the deliverer of Israel. You're going to overcome the Egyptians. Even though he would, then moved into Pharaoh's house, he knew his calling. He knew his mission. And when he was 40 years old, he says, baby, now's the time. I am ready. He killed an Egyptian, buried him in the sand like a cat does things. And so, and thought he had hidden it and covered it up. But it stunk, just, yeah, same thing. He had to run for his life. He totally messed up his life. 
because he tried to make it happen. I mean, you know, you may have a call of God on your life, but don't you force it. Don't you try to make it happen in your own strength. If you have to connive and manipulate, it ain't God. If you have to control, if you have to try to make things happen, it's a good sign that's not God. You need to wait. You need to wait. There's a word for someone here today that you, are, you have been seeking the Lord about a word, and I believe the word is wait. See, when Moses was 40, he thought he was ready, but he wasn't. And when he was 80, he didn't think he was ready, but he was. 80 stinking years old, 80 years old. He's got his AARP discounted Denny's, man. That's all he's thinking about in his life. And God comes to knock and he's like, what? Seriously, God, I'm 80. I want you to understand, it doesn't matter whether you're 8 or 80, God wants to use you. It's never too late. You're never too young. You're never too old. And so when Moses tried to make it happen, it ruined his life. He had to go live in the wilderness for 40 years. And he came to a place where he had to let God make it happen. God knows when you're ready and when you're not. There have been times I've rushed things in my life. I've wanted something, so I tried to make it happen. I tried to make it the will of God, even though it was my will. You know, I was saying, oh, Lord, let your will be done. But inside, I was like, and it better be what I want. <laughs> and so, so many times in Scripture, not only is timing important, so is waiting. Look at Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Do you have that faith? I want to challenge you to have that faith of this verse. You need to be confident that you're going to see God's goodness in your life. Things may be bad right now. Things may be messed up. Things may be miserable. But you got to rise above it and believe that you will see the goodness of God in your life. You'll see the goodness of God in your children. You'll see the good, goodness of God in your circumstances. you got to believe that. That's the first thing and most important thing. you got to believe in God's goodness, that God has good plans for you. You gotta, you gotta believe that, and here's the second thing, then you gotta wait for it. Verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. It says it twice, and so, do you, are you confident God's gonna work this out? Awesome, now wait for it. Man, I don't know about you, but the waiting is the hardest part. I'm just quoting, you know, rock stars all over the place this Sunday. <laughs> Tom Petty, for those who didn't know. And he's right. It is the hardest part. And yet, there's always a delay between the promise and the fulfillment. There's always a time. And God works out everything. Listen, God makes it beautiful in its time. And so the only way you're going to know the timing of God is to know his voice for him when he says, wait, wait for the right time. And when the time is right, number five, go when God says go. In my life, there are times where I go when God said, wait, and I wait when God says, go. We got to get this down right. But God said that don't come to the mountain. But he, did, he wasn't keeping them from the mountain forever. He said, just don't go to the mountain until you hear the ram's horn. Then come to me. I mean, God wanted them to come near to him. And so he says, you know, you just got to wait for the right time. But when you hear the horn, the sound of the ram's horn, you come to me. You come to the mountain. Go when God says go. The, the ram's horn was their cue. Sometimes God says wait. Other times God says go. So you better know his voice. You know, there are times we want to go. 
I just want out of here, man. I want out of this relationship. I want out of this job. I want out of this church. I want out of all of this. And yet God's saying, no, you got to wait. I'm not going to let you run. I'm not going to let you panic. You're going to wait. And I'm going to make all things beautiful. And then there are other times that God's like saying, come on, time to go. I don't want to go. That was Moses. I don't want to go. No way. I'm too old. Can't talk. I stutter. Please send somebody else. But look at these times where God said go. Genesis 7, 1. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. See, something was happening that had never happened before. It was raining. People were like, what's up? Man, what's that stuff falling from the sky? It's like being in Bakersfield. Whoa, what is that stuff? <laughs> what is this new phenomenon? And so it was starting to rain, and God says, get into the ark, go. Now it's time to go. We think of Lot and his wife. They were to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, but how many know his wife looked back? When God says go, don't look back. And so when God said go to Noah, it saved him and his family. Genesis 12, 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. Sometimes when God tells you to go, it'll take you out of your comfort zone. It'll take you away from your family. It'll take you away from what's familiar. But if you're going to accomplish your divine purpose, you've got to go. You've got to do what God says. In 35 years of pastoring, Jolene and I have always tried to find the balance of, of God's command to wait or to go. Exodus 4.19, speaking of Moses. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. Moses may have been going, what, what is taking so long? And then God says, I was waiting till everybody dropped over. Oh, okay, that's great. I mean, you know, it's good to go when everybody who hated you dropped dead. Don't pray that, okay, but uh, let God. And so I just want to encourage you today. God will speak to you. He longs to speak to you. He wants a relationship with you. But how can God speak to you if we're not speaking to him? If we go days without talking to God. I mean, you know, a marriage wouldn't survive if you go days and weeks and months without talking to each other. It's not going to make it. And so God will speak, but we've got to quiet ourselves. We've got to make our life simpler, less chaotic, less noise. And so... If he's going to speak, you've got to be ready for it. Consecrate yourself. Prepare your heart for his purpose. And then live within the limits. Don't, don't complain that you don't have as much money as so-and-so or you don't have the things so-and-so. That's not, that's not your business. It's God's business. Just live within what God gave you. Contentment is the key to living in your limits. Just, well, I may not have everything I want and everything I've longed for, but I'm going to live within what God has given me. And so often, God expands the boundaries. Wait for the right time. And go when God says go.